Hey students, it's Miss G, and I'm here because you wanted to do the extra credit assignment. So we're going to annotate book one, Athena Inspires the Pranks. So sing to me of the man, Muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and time again off course. Once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy, many cities of men he saw and learned their minds, many pains he suffered, heartsick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster. Hard as he strove, the recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools, they devour the cattle of the sun, and the sun god blotted out the day of their return. Launch on his story, Muse, the daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will and sing of our time, too. And so, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take out our blue highlighter, and we are going to highlight our epitaph. So, the man of twists and turns, and we're going to write down Odysseus because that is an epitaph for Odysseus. And again, an epitaph is just a fancy word for nickname. And so, next thing we're going to highlight, not really highlight, is we're going to underline once he had plundered the hollow heights of Troy. And we're going to put over here mentions the battle of. Troy. And this would have been famous for people that were living at this time and listening to this. Next thing we're going to do is, but he could not save them from disaster. But he could not save them from disaster hard as he strove the recklessness of their own ways to destroy them all the blind fools. They devoured the cattle of the sun and of the sun god. All right, and so, so sun god is another epitaph and that's for your boy Helios so we're gonna put Helios and then over here we're gonna go and write down our summary that it puts the blame on Odysseus's men because they're the ones that went and ate Helios's cows, so that's why they died. And so over here, we're going to draw. And so this is our summary for the whole thing. Homer, and that's the author, opens up with a, an invocation. Or prayer asking for the muse to help him tell the story of Odysseus. And so that's our annotation for the first stanza. If you need to go and finish it, Please pause the video. So by now, all the su survivors who avoided headlong death were safe at home, escaped the wars and waves, but one man alone, his heart set on his wife and his return. Calypso, the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess, held him back deep in her arching caverns, craving him for a husband. But then, when the wheeling seasons brought the year around, that year spun out by the gods when he should reach his home Ithaca, though not even there would he be free of trials, even among his loved ones. Then every god took pity, all except Poseidon. He raged on, seething against the great Odysseus till he reached his native land. So over here, but one man alone, his heart set on his wife and his return. And so that mentions Odysseus's motivation to return home. Calypso is a temptress. So we're going to also write temptress because that is an archetype that we learned about. Next thing, then every god took pity, all except Poseidon. He raged against, he raged on seizing on the great Odysseus until he reached his native land. And so over here, Poseidon is angry with Odysseus. This is the conflict. And then one more time. 
the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess. That is Calypso, so we're going to write over here Calypso because that is an epitaph. Calypso. Alright, so this is it for stanza two. If you're finished, if you need to copy this down, please take a moment and pause the video. Next one. But now Poseidon had gone to visit the Ethiopians, worlds away, Ethiopians off at the farthest limit of mankind, a people split in two. One part where the sun god sets, and part where the sun god rises. There Poseidon went to receive an offering, bulls and rams by the hundred, far away at the feast of the sea. Lord sat and took his pleasure, but the other gods at home in Olympian Zeus Hall met for, for, the, for full assembly there, and among them now, the father of men and gods was first to speak, sorely troubled, remembering handsome Agestus, the man Agamon's sons, renowned Orestes killed. Recalling Agestus, Zeus harangued the mortal, immortal powers. Ah, how shameless the way these mortals blame the gods. From us alone, they say, come all their miseries, yes, but they themselves, with their own reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is the sun god, and the sun god. And so we know that the sun god is Helios. The next thing, there Poseidon went to receive an offering of bulls and rams by the hundred far away at the feast of the sea lord sat and took his pleasure. So Poseidon was not with the other gods during the upcoming conversation because he was with the Ethiopians. Next thing we're going to highlight. Ah, oh, how shameless the way these mortals blame the god. From us alone, they say, come all their miseries, yes, but they themselves, their own reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. So Zeus mentions how humans blame their blame ah, the gods on their problems when it's their errors. And so again, Zeus mentions how humans blame the gods on their problems when it's their errors. And then the last thing is the father of men and gods. And that is Zeus. That is Zeus. So we're going to go here. All right. And so if you need this stanza, you can go and pause the video. All right. Let's turn the page. Look at a justice now. Above and beyond his share, he stole Aristides' wife. He murdered the warlord coming home from Troy, though he knew it meant his own total ruin. Far in advance, we told him ourselves, dispatching the guy, the giant killer Hermes. Don't murder the man, he said. Don't court his wife. Beware, revenge will come from Orestes, Agamon's son. That day he comes of age and longs for his native land. So Hermes warned, with all the good will in the world. But would a justice heart and heart give away? Now he pays the price all at a single stroke. And so... The guide and giant killer is Hermes. So we're going to come over here and we're going to write Hermes. And so what does Hermes do? Hermes tried to warn a justice So Hermes tried to warn Augustus to not take Agamemnon's wife, but he didn't listen. So if you need this, you can go and pause the video. If not, we can keep on going. All right. 
and sparkling-eyed Athena drove the matter home. Father, son of Kronos, our high and mighty king, surely who goes down to a death he earned in full. Let them all die, so all who do such things. But my heart breaks for Odysseus, that seasoned veteran cursed by fate so long, far from his home, far from his loved ones, still he suffers torments. Often a wave washed island rising at the center of the seas a dark wooden island and there a goddess makes her home a daughter of atlas wicked tiding who sounds the deep in all its depths whose shoulders lift on high the colossal pillars thrusting earth and sky apart atlas daughter it is who holds odysseus captive luckless man despite his tears forever trying to spellbind his heart with suave seductive words and wipe all thought of ithaca from his mind but he straining for no more than a glimpse of hearth smoke drifting up from his own land, Odysseus longs to die. And so, son of Kronos is Zeus. Zeus. Next thing is daughter of Atlas. And that is Calypso. And so that one is Atlas's daughter. So we're going to come over here. We're going to come over here. Draw an arrow. Draw an arrow, Calypso, and so, but my heart breaks for Odysseus, that seasoned veteran for so long, far from the loved ones, he suffers torment, off on a wave-washed island, and so we're going to write that Athena, that's a goddess, pleads with Zeus to take pity Odysseus. All right, so if you need this, go and pause your video. Oh wait, forgot one more. Luckless man. That is Odysseus. All right, now you can pause your video. So, Olympian Zeus, have you no care for him in your lofty heart? Did he ever win your favor with sacrifices, burned beside the ships on the broad plain of Troy? Why, Zeus, why are you so against Odysseus? My child, Zeus, who marshals the thunderheads, replied, what nonsense you let slip through your teeth. Now how on earth could I forget Odysseus, great Odysseus, who excels all men in wisdom, excels in offerings too. He gives the immortal gods who rule holding skies. Now it's the earth shaker. An earth shaker is Poseidon. unappeased right turn the page forever fuming against him for the cyclops whose giant eye he blinded godlike polyphemus towering over the cyclops clan in power the nymph thusa bore him daughter of Porcus, lord of the barren salt sea she met poseidon once in his vaulted caves and there made love and now for his blinded son the earthquake king god Though he won't quite kill Odysseus, drives him far off course from native land. But come, all of us here put heads together now. Work out his journey home so Odysseus can return. Lord Poseidon, I trust, will let his anger go. How can he stand his ground against the will of gods at once, one god alone? And so, the Cyclops, we're going to go from the Cyclops all the way down to 90. Whose giant eye he blinded, godlike Pophemus, towering over the Cyclops, clans in power, the nymph who support him, daughter of Porcus, lord of the barren salt sea, she met Poseidon once in his vaulted caves, they made love, and now for his blinded son, the earthquake god, though he won't quite kill Odysseus, drives him off his course from his native land. And so this is going to be Poseidon is angry with Odysseus for blinding his son, the Cyclops. As a result, he is making it difficult for Odysseus to get home and so then i see we have some epitaphs and so over here we have the lord of the barren salt sea and the earthly god and those are for poseidon draw a couple of arrows poseidon next thing how can he stand in his ground against the will of the gods or one god alone and so 
Odysseus is fake. Hangs on Zeus' decision to respect Poseidon. Anger or overrule it. Alright, so if you need this, make sure you go and pause it. So Athena, her eyes flash bright, exulting. Father, son of Cronus, our high and mighty king, it, if now, it really pleases the blissful gods that wise Odysseus shall return home at last. Let us dispatch the guide and giant killer Hermes down to Aiga Island, down to announce at once to the nymph with lovely braids our fixed decree. Odysseus journey home. The exile must return, while I myself go down to Ithaca, rouse his son to a braver pitch, inspire his heart with courage to summon the flowing haired Achaeans to full assembly, speak his mind to all those suitors slaughtering on and on his droves of sheep and shambling longhorn cattle. Next I will send him off to Sparta and Sandy Pylos, there to learn of his dear father's journey home. Perhaps he will hear some news and make his name throughout the mortal war. So, over here, son of Kronos is Zeus. Zeus. The guy in Giant Killer, and that's Hermes. The nymph. That's Calypso. And these are just epitaphs that we need to go. Calypso. And then over here, the exile. And the exile is referring to Odysseus. Odysseus. Alright, and so over here, let's go and draw a little bracket. And so Athena says she will go to Ithaca to speak to Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, while Hermes will go to Calypso so if you need this one you can go ahead and pause it so Athena vowed and under her feet she fastened the supple sandals ever grow glowing gold the wing her over the waves and boundless earth with a rush of gusting winds she sees that rugged spear tipped with a bronze point weighted heavy and the massive shaft she wields to break the lines of heroes the mighty father's daughter storms against and down she swept from olympus's craggy peaks and lit on ithaca standing tall at odysseus's gates the threshold of his court gripping her bronze spear she looked over she looked for all the world like a stranger like mentes lord of the tycanes all right so gripping her bronze spear she looked for all the world like a stranger and so Athena takes on the form of Mentees. All right, so if you knew this one, you can go ahead and pause. All right, let's turn that page. All right, so there she found the swaggering suitors just then amusing themselves with rolling dice before the doors lounging on hides of oxen they had killed themselves while heralds and brisk attendants bustled around them some at the mixing bowls mulling wine and water others wiping the tables down with sopping sponges setting them out in place while other servants joined and carved the great sides of meat and so there is a big party at Odysseus's house. All right, if you need to go and pause the video, go ahead and pause the video. First by far to see her was Prince Telemachus sitting among the suitors, 
heart obsessed with grief he could almost see his magnificent father here in the midst eye only he might drop from the clouds and drive these suitors on a route throughout the halls and regain his pride and place and rule his own domains daydreaming so he sat among the suitors he glimpsed athena now and straight to the porch he went mortified that a guest might still be standing at the doors pausing behind beside her there he clasped the right hand and relieving her at once of her long brown spears met her with winged words greetings stranger here in our house you'll find a royal welcome have supper first then tell us what you need and so we're gonna come over here and we're gonna go first by far all the way down to the doors and you're gonna write telemachus is sitting down during the festivities, and that means the parties, daydreaming about his father coming and beating up the suitors. And how do we know that? Because he says, and drive these suitors on a route throughout the halls. And so that's how we know that. And so he goes and he said, and straight to the porch he went that a guest might be standing at the doors. And this shows hospitality. And then over here, greeting stranger. Telemachus is eager to extend hospitality of his house to all. Right, so if you knew this one, you should go and pause. He led the way, and Pallas Athena followed. Once in the high-roofed hall, he took her lance and fixed it firm in a burnished rack against the sturdy pillar. There were rows on rows of spears. In battle, Odysseus' spears took, stood stacked and waiting. Then he escorted her to a high, elaborate chair of honor. Over it draped a cloth, and here he placed her guest with a stool to rest her feet. But for himself, he drew up a low reclining chair beside her richly painted clear of the press of suitors concerned his guest offended by their uproar might shrink from food in the midst of such a mob he hoped that's more to ask him of his long-lost father a maid brought water soon in a graceful golden pitcher and over a silver basin tipped it out so they might rinse their hands and then pulled a gleaming table to their side a staid housekeeper brought on bread to serve them appetizers of plenty too lavish with her bounty and so over here then he escorted the guest of honor all the way to such a mob so, this shows hospitality. The best chair. The best seat. And concern for the guest. And how do we know that? Because he said, a high elaborate chair of honor, draped the cloth, a stool to rest her feet concerned his guests offended by the uproar and the last thing we're going to do here is Pallas because Pallas is an epitaph for Athena all right so if you need to go and pause this make sure you go and pause it all right turn the page a carver lifted platters of meat towards them meats of every sort and set beside them golden cups and time and again a page came round and poured them wine but now the suitors trooped in with all their swagger and took their seats on low and high back chairs heralds poured water over their hands for rinsing servant maids brought bread heaped high in chair and trays and the young men brimmed the mixing bowls with wine they reached out for good things that lay on hand and when they put aside their desire for food and drink the suitors set their minds on other pleasures song and dancing all that crowns a feast a herald place an ornate lyre in Perneus's hands, the bard who always performed among them there, they forced the man to sing. So there is a party going on here. And so party is going on and everyone is enjoying their fill. And so they put their side their desire for food and drink. Their minor other pleasures, song and dancing, 
Daryl's poured water over their hands for rinsing. Serving maids brought them bread heaped in trays. And the young men brimmed their bowls with wine. There we go. Alright, so if you need this one, you can go and pause it. So, a rippling prelude, but no sooner than he had struck up his rousing song than Telemachus, head close to Athena's sparkling eyes, spoke low to his guests so no one could hear him. Dear stranger, would you be shocked by what I say? Look at them over there. Not a care in the world, just leers and tunes. It's easy for them, all right? They feed on another goods and go scot-free. A man whose white bones lie strewn in the rain somewhere, rotting away on land or rolling down the ocean's salty swells. But that man, if they caught sight of him home in Ithaca, by God, they'd all pray to be faster on their feet and richer in bars of gold and heavy robes. But now, no use. He's died a wretched death. No comforts left for us. Not even if someone, somewhere says he's coming home, the day of ret his return will never come. And so over here, it's easy for them, all right? They feed on another goods, go scot-free all the way to a salty swell. And so over here, Telemachus mentions that the suitors steal and take Odysseus's goods. He doesn't know where or how his father died. But the audience, that's us, knows Odysseus is alive. So he doesn't know that, but the audience knows that. So if you need this, please go ahead and pause it. Enough, enough. Tell me about yourself. Now clearly, point by point, who are you? Where are you from? Your city, your parents. What sort of vessel brought you? Why do the sailors land you here in Ithaca? Who do they say they are? I hardly think you came this way on foot. And tell me this for a fact. I need to know. Is this your first time here? Or are you a friend of father's, a guest from the old days? Once crowds of other men would come to our house on visits. Visitor that he was when he walked among the living. And so Telemachus... Mentees, who is really Athena, about who they are. If Mentees knew his father. Because remember, he doesn't know his father, so he wants to know other people that know his father. Alright, so at this point, if you need this, go ahead and pause the video. Alright, let's turn to the page. Her eyes glistening, goddess Athena answered. My whole story, of course, I'll tell it point by point. Why is all Sirius? Was my father. My own name is Mentes, lord of Typhon. Men who love the oars, but then, but here I've come, just now, with ship and crew, sailing the wine dark sea to foreign ports of call, to Tamiz out of bronze, our cargo gleaming iron, our ship lies moored off farmlands, far from town, riding in Rithron Cove, beneath Mount Neon's woods. As for the ties between your father and myself, we've been friends forever, I'm proud to say, and he would bear me out. If you went and questioned old Lord Larades, he, I gather, no longer ventures into town, but lives a life of hardship all to himself, off on his farm steed, with an aged servant woman who tends him well, who gives him food and drink with weariness, has taken hold of his withered limbs from hauling himself along his vine vineyards, steep slopes. And now I've come, and why? I heard that he was back, your father, that is. But no, the gods thwart his passage, and yet I tell you, great Odysseus is not dead. He's still alive, somewhere in this wide world, held captive out at sea, on a wave-washed island, and hard men, savages, somehow hold him against his will. And so Athena, you're going to go all the way to himself. So Athena, maybe I put this too far now. Athena introduces herself as Mentes, the friend of Telemachus's grandfather. And then over here, yet yeah, tell you all the way to the end. Boom. 
Athena, Hells, Telemachus, that Odysseus is alive. Oh yeah. Alright, so if you need this, go ahead and pause the video. It's over here. Wait! I'll make you a prophecy one the immortal gods have planted in my mind, and it will come true. I think, though I'm hardly a seer or know the flights of birds, he won't be gone long from the native land he loves, not even if iron shackles bind your father down. He's plotting a way to journey home at last, and he's never at peace. So, Athena makes a prophecy that Odysseus Cool. Alright, so if you do this, make sure you pause it. But come, please tell me about yourself now, point by point. You're truly Odysseus's son. You've sprung up so uncanny resemblance to the head, the fine eyes. I see how. How often we used to meet in the old days before he embarked for Troy, where other Argive captains, all the best men, sailed in the long curved ships. From then to this very day, I've not sent my eyes on Odysseus or he on me. Alright, so turn the page. And young Telemachus cautiously replied, I'll try, my friend, to give you a frank answer. Mother has always told me I'm his son, it's true. So I am not so certain who, on his own, has ever really known who gave him life. Would to God I've been the son of a happy man whom old age overtook in the midst of his possessions. Now think of the most unlucky mortal ever born since you ask me. Yes, they say I am his son. Still, the clear-eyed goddess reassured him, trust me, the gods have not marked out your house for such an unsung future, not if Penelope has borne a son like you, but tell me about all of this, and spare me nothing. What's this banquet in this crowd caressing, caressing here? What part do you play yourself? Some wedding feast, some festival? Hardly a potluck sucker. Supper, I would say how obscenely they lounge and swagger here. Look, gorging in your house. Why, any man of sense who's chanced among them would be outraged seeing such behavior. And so Athena asked, Why are the suitors at the house? Partying and feasting. So if you need this, make sure you pause the video. Alright, let's keep on reading. Ready, Telemachus took her up at once. Well, my friend, seeing you want to probe and press the question, once the house was rich, no doubt, beyond reproach, when the men you mentioned still lived here at home, now the gods have reversed our fortunes with a vengeance, wiped that man from the earth like no one else before. I would have... I would never have grieved so much about his death if he had gone down with comrades off in Troy or died in the arms of loved ones once he had wound down the long coil of war. Then all united, Archaea would have raised his tomb, and then he won his son great fame for years to come. But now the whirlwinds have whipped him away. No fame for him. He's lost and gone now, out of sight, out of mind. And I, he's left me tears and grief, nor do I wreck my heart with grief. For him alone, no longer now the gods have invented other miseries to plague me. All right, so Telemachus feels wronged because his father is not home. He did not die in war. Or battle. Instead, he feels punished by the gods. And how do we know that? Because he says, now the gods have invented other miseries to plague me. Alright, so if you need this, make sure you go and pause the video. Listen, all the nobles who rule the island around about Delucian, and same, and wooded Zenithus, too, and all who lord it in rocky Ithaca as well. Right, Down to the last man, they court my mother, they lay waste my house, and my mother, she neither rejects a marriage she despises, nor can she bear to bring the courting to an end, while they continue to bleed my household white. Soon you'll wait, they'll grind me down as well. And so Telemachus... feels shameful at 
how the suitors treat his home. They want to marry his mother, and her name is Penelope. Alright, I think it's spelled that Alright, so if you need this, make sure you go and pause it. Shameful bringing with indignation. Pallas Athena broke out. Oh, how much you need Odysseus gone so long. How he lay hands on all these brave and suitors. If only he would appear now at his house's outer gates and take his stand, armed with his helmet, shield, and pair of spears, as strong as the man I glimpsed that first time in our own house, drinking wine and reveling there, just come in from Ephyria, visiting Ilias, Mermis' son. Odysseus sailed that way, you see, in his swift trim ship, hunting deadly poison to smear on his own arrow's bronze heads. Ellis refused. He feared the wrath of the everlasting God. But father, so fond of him, gave him all he wanted. If only that Odysseus sported with these suitors, a blood wedding, a quick death would take the lot. True, but all lies in the lap of the great gods, whether or not he will come and pay them back here in his own house. And so again, Pallas is Athena. Next one. But you, I urge you, think how to drive these suitors from your halls. Come now, listen closely. Take my word to heart. By daybreak, summon the island's lords to full assembly. Give your orders to all and call the gods to witness. Tell the suitors to scatter each to his own place. As for your mother, if the spirit moves her to marry, let her go back to her father's house, a man of power. Her kin will arrange the wedding, provide the gifts, the array that goes with a daughter dearly loved. And so over here, but you... All the way. Listen closely. All right. So Athena says that Telemachus needs to get these suitors out of his house. All right. So if you need this, go ahead and pause it. For you, I have some good advice. If only you will accept it. Fit out a ship with twenty oars, the best in sight. Sail in quest for news of your long lost father. Someone may tell you something, or you may catch a rumor straight from Zeus. Rumor that carries news to men like nothing else. First go down to Pylos, question old King Nestor. Then cross over to Sparta to red king to red haired Menelaus. And so Athena tells Telemachus. gather a crew and sail to Pylos and then Sparta in search of information on his father. Alright, so if you need this, go ahead and pause it. All right, let's turn the page. Of all bronze armored Achaeans, the last man back. Now if you hear your father's alive and heading home, hard pressed as you are, brave, out one more year. If you hear he's dead, no longer among the living, then back you come to the native land you love. Raise his grave mound, build his honors high with the full funeral rites that he deserves and give your mother to another husband. Then, once you've sealed those matters, seen them through, think hard and reach down in your heart and soul for a way to kill these suitors in your house, by stealth or in open combat. You must not cling to your boyhood any longer. It's time you were a man. Haven't you heard what glory Prince Orestes won throughout the world when he killed that cunning murderous Augustus who killed his famous father? And so over here, do, 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 you must not cling to your boyhood. All right, so Athena tells Telemachus that it is time to be a man. He must avenge his father by killing the suitors just like Prince Orestes avenged his father, Agamemnon, where is it, Agamemnon, 
by killing his father's murderer. So Athena tells Telemachus that it's time to be a man. He must avenge his father by killing the suitors, just like Prince Orestes avenged his father Agamemnon by killing his father's murderer. So if you need that, go ahead and pause it. And you, my friend, how tall and handsome I see you now. Be brave, you too. So men to come will sing your praises down the years. But now I must go back to my shift, my swift trim ship, and all my shipmates chafing there, I'm sure, waiting for my return. It all rests with you. Take my word to heart. Oh, stranger, he did Telemachus replied. Indeed I will. You've counseled me with such so much kindness now, like a father to a son. I won't forget a word, but come, stay longer, keen as you are to sail, so you can bathe and rest and lift your spirits. Then go back to your ship, delighted with a gift, a prize of honor, something rare and fine as a keepsake for myself, the kind of gift a host will give a stranger friend to friend. All right, it's over here. Telemachus thanks the stranger, and we know that the stranger is Athena, for the advice he wants to thank the stranger with a gift. All right, so at this point, if you need that, please go ahead and pause the video. All right, her eyes glinting, Paulus declined in haste. Not now, don't hold me here. I long to be on my way. As for the gift, whatever you'd give in kindness, save it for my return so I can take it home. Choose something rare and fine, and a good reward that gift is going to bring you. All right, so Paulus is Athena. And over here, Athena says, thanks, but no thanks to the gift. At this point, if you need that, please go ahead and pause it up. With that promise off and away, Athena, the bright-eyed goddess, flew away. And so, bright-eyed goddess, that is Athena. All right, turn the page. Like a bird in soaring flight, but left. His spirit filled with nerve and courage, charged with his father's memory more than ever now. He felt his senses quicking, overwhelmed with wonder. This was a god. He knew it well and made it once for the suitors a man like a god himself. All right, so you're going to come here. So Telemachus feels brave and his memory for his father grows stronger. He thinks the stranger was a god. All right, so if you need this, please go ahead and pause it. Amidst them, still the famous bard sang on, and they sat in silence listening as he performed the Achaean's journey home from Troy. All the blows Athena doomed them to door. And now from high above her room and deep in thought he caught his inspired strains Icarus's daughter Penelope wearing reserved and down the steep stair from her chamber she descended. Not alone two of her women followed close behind that rady woman once she reached her suitors drawing her glistening veil across her cheeks paused now where a column propped the sturdy roof with one of her loyal handmaids stationed either side suddenly dissolving in tears and bursting through the bard's inspired voice she cried out Perneus! So many other songs you know to hold us spellbound, works of the gods and men that singers celebrate. Sing one of those as you sit beside them here. And they drink their wine in silence. And so Penelope, oh, Penelope, comes down from her room and asks the bard or the performer, to stop singing about the Greeks' journey home it makes her sad. 
Alright, so if you need this, please go ahead and pause it. But break off the song, the undurable song that always rends the heart inside me, the unforgettable grief, it wounds me most of all. How I long for my husband, alive, in memory always, that great man whose fame resounds through Hellas, right to the depths of Argos. Why, mother, poised Telemachus, put in sharply, why deny our devouted bard the chance to entertain us? Any way the spirit stirs him on. Bards are not to blame. Zeus is to blame. He deals to each and every laborer on this earth, whatever doom he pleases. Why fault the bard if he sings the Argive's harsh fate? It's always the latest song, the one that echoes last the listener's ear, that people praise the most. Courage, mother. Harden your heart and listen. Odysseus was scarcely the one you... No. Alright, so then here... Telemachus rebuked, and so that means he like, he like kind of yelled at his mom, rebukes Penelope and reminds her that Zeus, not the bard, is responsible for Odysseus's suffering. All right, so if you need that, please go ahead and pause it. Right, next one. Whose journey home was blotted out at Troy. Others, so many others died there too. All right. So he tells her to have courage and listen to the song and remember Odysseus. Alright, so if you need that, please go ahead and pause it. So, mother, go back to your quarters, tend to your own task, the distaff and the loom, and keep the women working hard as well. As for giving orders, men will see to that, but I most of all, I hold the reins of powers in this house. And so, astonished, she withdrew to her room. She took to heart the clear good sense in what her son had said, climbing up to the lofty chamber with her women, she fell weeping for Odysseus, her beloved husband, to watch Athena sealed her eyes with welcome sleep. So Penelope goes to her room and is surprised by Telemachus's good sense and good will. Athena gives her rest. Alright, so if you need that, go ahead and pause it. But the suitors broke into uproar through the shattered halls, all of them lifting prayers to lie beside her, share her bed, until discreet Telemachus took command. You suitors who plague my mother, you, you insolent overweening, for this evening, let us dine and take our pleasure. No more shouting now. What a fine thing it is to listen to such a bard as we have here, and the man sings like a god. But at first light, we all march forth to assembly, take our seats, so I can give my orders and say to you straight out, you must leave my See to your feasting elsewhere. Devour your own possessions house by house by turns. But if you decide the fare is better, richer here, destroying one man's goods and going scot-free, then carve away. But I'll cry out to the everlasting gods and hope that Zeus will pay you back with vengeance. All of you. All right, so over here. So you suitors all the way down here. So Telemachus. Ooh, he got some courage addresses the suitors. He tells them to leave his house or Zeus will punish them for their bad behavior. So Zeus will punish you. Alright, so if you need that, please go ahead and pause it. So Telemachus declared, and they all bit their lips, amazed the prince could speak with so much daring. All right, so over here. The suitors are shocked that the prince
confidence has confidence and bravery because remember he's just been sitting there and now he's like not anymore all right so if you knew that please go ahead and pause it you fit the sun and Tinoes broke their silence. Well, Ptolemachus, only the gods could teach you to sound so high and mighty such brave talk. I pray that Zeus will never make you king of Ithaca, though your father's crown is no doubt yours by birth. And so, and Tinoes responds that only the gods could give Telemachus the power to speak so bravely. Alright, so at this point, if you need that, please go ahead and pause the video. Alright, let's turn the page. We're almost done. But cool-headed Telemachus countered firmly. Antinous, even though my words may offend you, I'd be happy to take the crown if Zeus presents it. You think that nothing worse could befall a man? It's really not so bad to be a king. All at once your palace grows in wealth, your honors grow as well. But there are hosts of other Achaean princes. Look, young and old, crowds of them on our island here, and any of the lot might hold a throne. Now great Odysseus is dead, but I'll be lord of my own house and servants, all that King Odysseus won for me by force. And so... Telemachus is a little brave boy. So Telemachus addresses Antinous that he has claim to his father's throne. If his father is dead. Alright, so if you need that, please go ahead and pause it. And now, your Micus, Chloe's son, stepped in. Surely this must lie in the gods' lap, Telemachus. Which Achaean will lord it over a secret Ithaca? Do hold on to your own possessions. Rule your house. God forbid that anyone tear your holdings from your hands while men still live in Ithaca. But about your guest, dear boy, I have some questions. Where does he come from? Where is his country, his birth, his father's old estates? Did he bring some news of your father, his return? Or did he come on business of his own? How he leapt on his feet, off he went. No waiting around for proper introductions. And by no mean man. Not by the looks of him, I'd say. And so over here, boom. So, your moccas says the gods decide who will be king of Ithaca and ask about the stranger and that's Mentes. All right so if you need that please go ahead and pause it. Eurymachus, Telemachus answered truly. Clearly my father's journey home is lost forever. I no longer trust in rumors from the blue, nor bother with any prophecy. When my mother calls some wizard into the house to ask him questions. As for the stranger, though, the man's an old family friend from Taphos. Wise Achilles' son. He says his name is Mentes, lord of the Tuffian men who love their oars. And so Telemachus... tells them that the stranger was Mentes, friend of Laertes, and that is Odysseus's father. So if you need that, you can go and pause it. So he said, but deep in his mind he knew the immortal goddess. Now the suitor turned to dance and song, to the lovely beat and sway, waiting for dust to come upon them there. And then the dark night came upon them, lost in pleasure, finally to bed, each to his own house. So, do, 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 do. first line. In his heart, Telemachus knows that Mentes so he knows in his heart and the last line here it says the suitors leave 
All right, so if you need that, please go ahead and pause it. All right, so turn the page. This is our last one. So Telemachus off to his bedroom, built in the fine courtyard, a commanding lofty room set apart, retired to his spirit swarming his, with misgivings. His devoted nurse attended him, bearing a glowing torch. Eurycia, the daughter of Ops, Piazner's son. Lorades had paid a price for the woman years ago, still in the bloom of youth. He traded twenty oxen, honored her on a par with his own loyal wife at home, but fearing the queen's anger, never shared her bed. She was his grandson's escort now and bore a torch, for she was the one of all the maids who loved the prince the most. She nursed him as a baby. He spread the doors of his snug, well-made room, sat down on the bed and pulled his, sir, sh his soft shirt off and tossed into the old woman's conscientious hands. And after folding it neatly, patting it smooth, she hung it on a peg beside his corded bed and then padded from the bedroom, drawing the door shut with a silver hook, sliding the door bolt home with his rawhide strap. There all night long, wrapped in his sheep's warm fleece, he weighed in his mind the course Athena charted. And so over here, it talks about Eurycia. And Eurycia. I don't think I spelled that right. I might have. All right, so Eurycia is Telemachus's maid. She was a slave bought by Lorades, and that's his grandfather. She was respected by Lorades, and now watches over Telemachus. Our last one. There we go. Telemachus has his own odyssey to go on. He needs to find out what happened to Odysseus. All right, so those are your annotations. Again, you're doing these annotations, it is optional, it's because you want to raise your quiz grade. If you don't choose to do it, this is something that you're going to have to deal with. I hope you guys do it. If you don't, I still love you guys. All right, so I'll see you guys next time. Bye!